I want to use this weekday 24 hour massive haul of outgoing shipments to illustrate a point and also to brag just a little bit maybe that quick flipping is not a race to the bottom. Quick flipping is a very valid and a uh, very fruitful way to approach any kind of reselling and to approach clothing reselling. I have been what I consider to be a quick flipper for clothing for probably two solid years at least now, two and a half. And that is an adaptation off of doing things very differently when I first started reselling, which was just kind of having a mental list of brands that I like and having a mental list of price set points and pricing in accordance with those and also pricing in accordance with kind of the me or the median value of sold listings so for example if i had a tommy bahama shirt and there are tommy bahama shirts selling for between 20 and 50 bucks maybe i would price it at 35. and that's kind of standard received wisdom for clothing reselling there's nothing wrong with it i've talked this point to death. There's no real right or wrong way to price something. But the more I started focusing on high sell through sourcing and low pricing for the stuff that I do source, the more I started realizing these quick returns. And every time that I have moved away or drifted back towards the old model of pricing and sourcing, the more I have been punished for it with long wait times to realize marginally larger returns on the sourcing investment. Meaning the same stuff, because I price it even five bucks, 10 bucks higher, just because I feel like I can get away with it or feel like it's what I should do as a reseller, as a good reseller, I will have to sit on the thing for much longer, sometimes months longer to, to flip it. And it's hard to kill those instincts. As much as I'm the quick quick flip guy for clothing, it's hard to divorce your emotional expectations from wanting to get a certain higher return on on the stuff that you're you're selling, just based on your own experience, based on peer pressure from other resellers. And you should consider quick flipping as one option among many. It's great, especially for certain circumstances, let's say overall sluggish eBay sales, overall very sluggish eBay clothing sales, uh, having anemic cash flow for your reselling business seasonally. Quick flipping can level out a lot of those peaks and valleys or raise the bottom of those valleys. My sales have been like that and I started refocusing back on the quick flipping and it's more like this. It's a much smoother ride. A lot of the stuff that I've been listing has been selling within 24, 48, 72 hours. Some of it's been selling in a week. Some of it's gonna sit around for a while, admittedly. This is not an exact science and there's no way to force sales to happen on your own timeline. It just doesn't happen. But you open yourself up to more consistent sales and the whole process becomes more fun. That's one of the reasons I like quick flipping because I know that I can go out be hyper selective about what I source. I don't have to have a level of anxiety of knowing that I don't know for sure that I'm gonna actually get a return on this. You know, you never know for sure, but most of the stuff that I am sourcing now, I'm like 95% confident I will get a return on on a reasonable timeline, meaning less than a couple months for the most part. And it just, it's, it's just fun. It's fun to go out, buy a shirt for seven bucks and know that I can just bounce it in and out of my store. I can just drop it and it'll bounce out within a couple days a lot of the time and I won't get a huge return, but I will get a return. I might double my money. I might make only seven bucks, which is pretty measly for a lot of people. Um, if that's too, you know, if you're not willing to put in the work to realize seven bucks on a single item, perfectly reasonable, but I, I definitely am. Yeah, you, know, you make seven or 10 bucks, but it's just, you're dribbling. You're just, you're just bouncing the stuff. And it's, it's really fun. I really enjoy it. And I wanna offer you a couple pieces of wisdom about how to do it and how to have the discipline to do it. And 
give you a fishing metaphor, which is of course obligatory <laughs> for for uh, some of these videos. The thing to do, I've been implementing this thought experiment, I'll call it, of you have to look at what you have divorced completely from your history with it and with your level of, I guess, context, your sense of context for it. So for example, I just listed a Robert Graham shirt. It's a good size, it was 2XL, really visually gaudy and loud, had weird zigzag striping, it was two colors, flip cuffs. Something that all of my experience and instincts told me, price at 35. And just out of curiosity, I looked at the market and on eBay right now, relatively low demand for rubber gram compared to historically where it's been. And the bottom of the market is pretty low. The bottom of the market is hovering around 25 bucks, meaning people are pricing their rubber gram shirts from 25 bucks and up. And there are a lot of rubber gram shirts that are ostentatious and loud and flip cuff and embroidered and good sizes that are on sale for 25 bucks, giving the buyer base less motivation to pay up for your listing if you're gonna follow the traditional model of pricing at 35, 40 or more. Yes, you can still sell it for 35, 40 or more, but it's a less reliable way to realize a return and you will make more return, but it will probably very likely take you longer to do it. I'm perfectly happy selling a $7 rubber gram shirt for 25 and just basically doubling my money. Perfectly happy to do it because I can sell that rubber gram shirt in just a handful of days. So I priced it at 25 and it hurts. It, uh, you get that, that knee jerk reaction of you feel like you're throwing yourself under the bus somehow. Simply because it's a rubber gram shirt, simply because you have this emotional association with the brand and with your history, you're attached to this history that you have with Robert Graham. You can't step in the same river twice. And I, that's not the fishing metaphor. But um, if that was a Duluth Trading Co shirt, I would not have had any kind of like emotional hurdle to overcome to sell it. If it was a North Face shirt, I wouldn't have to uh, do this spiritual battle to force myself to price it at 25. And I think that's where people get stuck. When I am looking at a shirt, a good thing that I've started doing is just, just shear it of all of its aesthetic properties and its brand and every, every association that you have with it. And just imagine it's like this gray cube. It's this pure commodity. It's like, a, it's just a widget. It's just this doodad. And then price it and you know, research all the relevant keywords for the doodad, and then sell the doodad at a price that is gonna be a bargain for people, which is what people are really looking for when they're shopping on eBay for the most part. It's really easy to lose the context that you're an eBay seller. I'm assuming that you're selling on eBay. Same goes for Poshmark, same goes for any online platform where private sellers sell used clothing or used goods in general. The reason the buyers are on these platforms is because they want a bargain for the most part. They want something really rare that they can't get elsewhere and or they want something that they can get elsewhere for significantly cheaper. What constitutes a good deal? You have to keep in mind that none of these brands, none of these items have inherent price. Price is, is determined on this very complicated rubric of market forces that has nothing to do with any kind of inherent value for the most part of any particular commodity. And price is largely just determined, as we all know, by supply and demand. And it doesn't matter how much history a commodity has, it doesn't matter how much it has sold for in the past, it doesn't matter how much you want it to sell for. All that matters is how much it is selling for. So the Robert Graham shirt, I could price it at 35.40, but there's a lot that people are buying at 25. And I wanna sell mine at 25. I consider that a quick flip. 
So just imagine the thing as a cube. Just imagine it's just a little a little piece of dirt. It's just a little little ball of tin foil that's been crushed up into a ball, and for some reason people want pieces of tin foil that have been crushed up into balls. And price that way. Think about it that way. And the second you stop this uh, this emotional attachment to the things that you're selling, the easier it will be for you to be effective, especially if you're pursuing something like the quick flip. Another way to to make the quick flip thing make sense is to look at it for what it is and what reselling is, which is a form of investing. And I am nowhere close to being a good investor or someone who has like investment literacy, but I know just a little bit and I know enough to know that even being able to realize a 50% return on investment within a few days is an astonishingly high return as far as investments go. Being able to realize 25% return on an investment, even over the course of a year, is pretty good. And being able to consistently double or triple or quadruple your money that you invest on a very short timeline is almost a singularly unique investment opportunity, which is what we're really doing. You're investing five, seven, 10 bucks at a time and you're getting return of five, seven, ten bucks uh, when the stuff sells. If you're doing a quick flip or more, if you're pricing the, the stuff higher, it's a form of investing. So just look at it like that. And there are, of course, legitimate criticisms of the quick flip model. It's not perfect for everybody. If you if if you're not willing to put in the time to source and list an item and only make between seven and fifteen bucks on it when it comes to clothing, not for you. And it, there are good reasons to to not want to put in that amount of time, maybe. But you have to be able to look at it objectively and say, I'm happy making a hundred percent return on a small investment within seventy two hours. That sounds good to me. And once you see that as the win that it is, it becomes much less difficult to justify doing it to yourself, or at least that's the case for me. So there's an experience for my life that I think is, is really uh, a good illustration of quick flipping. And I'll try to keep this short and relatable for non-fisher people. So a couple of years ago, I was trout fishing up in the Eastern Sierras in California with my dad and a family friend, and we wanted to catch trout to make dinner. We wanted to fish for meat. This is way pre-veganism. I still occasionally would catch and eat fish. And there was a limit of five trout at this lake we were fishing, which is North Lake, if anybody's familiar with the area. It's this beautiful alpine lake. It's like 9,000 feet up. Beautiful, clean, crystal clear water. It's full of fish and fishing was tough. So when water is really clear, a lot of the times the fish can become hard to catch. And the biggest deal is when the fish are heavily pressured, meaning when the fish are fished for by a lot of anglers over the course of their lives, and even within a short span of time, if, they, if they're hit with a lot of fishing pressure, they, they smarten up, they get hard to catch. They become skeptical of lures and bait. They'll visually inspect it really closely and they're reluctant to bite. And that was true of this lake on that day. There was a lot of fishing pressure. It was the weekend. There were a ton of people fishing and they just really weren't biting. You could see them. They were kind of swimming freely. A lot of them just kind of making a circuit around the lake and you could, you could cast the lure out to them and drag it past them. They would just ignore it. And that's a situation that any, any angler is familiar with. It was frustrating because I, you know, had this expectation of I want to be the breadwinner or the trout winner and and eat trout. So I walked around the shore and there was this stretch of rocky shoreline that was really steep and no one was really fishing there. And I was looking in the water and I noticed there was this school of trout that were suspended just off the shore in this really concentrated bunch of like a hundred trout or something. They were all just collected in this one area. And I knew that if I, if I cast a lure to them, it was just gonna spook them. They weren't being aggressive. They were being conservative. They wanted live bait of some kind, or that was what was gonna work the best. I happened to have a little jar of salmon eggs, cured salmon eggs with me. So I put on a tiny hook about that big. I put one or two salmon eggs on it, no weight. And I just flicked it out on really light line so that it would 
slowly sink in the water right in front of them. And I knew that those trout would be able to smell the eggs and their brain would calculate that they would only have to move that far to eat the salmon eggs and that I would probably be able to catch them and I did. I caught a stringer of trout probably in 15-20 minutes. I just flicked it out, let it slowly fall and they would come up slowly, slowly, kind of look at it, smell it and just open their mouths and eat it like that, expending like a calorie to get a small meal. And I would just be able to catch them one after the other up on the bank on the stringer. Everybody at the lake watching me with smoke coming out of their ears. And I smugly walked off with this tree branch strung with, uh, with trout on it. And not three minutes later, there, were, there was a guy standing right on the same spot, casting lure and getting nothing. And I think that this is a perfect metaphor for quick flipping clothing. In this metaphor, let's say that the eBay used clothing market is the lake. It's a big lake. There's buyers all over the place. You can see them swimming around. And there is a handful of buyers that if you were to throw out a big gob of salmon eggs like this or a big gob of night crawlers on a giant hook, every once in a while you would catch one. One of the hyper aggressive, uncritical, especially hungry trout. You would be able to catch fish. People were still catching fish, just not that many. Using bigger lures, flashier presentations that would have taken more confidence on the part of the trout to eat more motivated trout and every once in a while they would basically get lucky and they would find those trout and connect with them and they'd be able to catch one or two. In my experience, buyers behave like the trout in this lake in that the majority of buyers are going to be concentrated in very specific places and they're going to have really specific motivations. So in my experience, the majority of the buyers are looking for uh, kind of generic known stuff that they can get for really cheap or they're looking for pricier stuff or unique stuff that they can still get at a discount. That Those are the two parts of the lake. If you were to say, if you were to designate physical areas for those two buyer bases, that's where you're going to find those fish stacked up and they're not going to be willing to expend that much energy. They're not going to be willing to take that much risk on your, your lure or your bait. And in the context of this metaphor, this, the kind of stuff that I sell is the couple of salmon eggs on a little hook. It's something that a lot of people want and I'm giving it to them about as cheap as they can possibly get it online. And I'm not giving them any cause to have skepticism. I'm offering 60 day returns. Uh, I'm, I'm giving them free shipping, which of course is controversial. I'm taking clear photos, clear descriptions, uh, honest descriptions, showing them all the flaws. I have great customer feedback. This is a low risk proposition for them. And it's just a little, like for example, if I got a Patagonia shirt, if I got an organic cotton men's large plaid short sleeve button up shirt, if I price that at 20 bucks, that's a little piece of organic cotton flotsam that is just drifting down the water column and that's going to be really appealing to the majority of the trout in that section. So I don't know if that's going to be as helpful for you as it is for me, but I think about that almost every time that I source. You're just, you're looking to flick the little salmon eggs right out, right on the trout's noses and make it really easy for them. And when you do that, you will catch a lot of trout. And I would rather catch a stringer of five trout in 20 minutes than wait with a big gob of night crawlers on a one ounce weight flung out into the middle of the lake to catch one trout that I hope will be the same mass as five trout put together. So I hope that helps. I hope that elucidates. And quick flipping is not the be all end all. It's not a cheat code. It's not magic and it has risks associated with it that I've talked about a lot on this channel. But if you're interested in trying it, I hope that this helps uh, clarify how to do it better and how to do it without feeling guilty. Hey, it's later. I just got back from a sourcing trip and I wanted to make an addendum to this video because one of the most consistent criticisms 
that I get about my business model and the brands that I advocate picking up is that it's not scalable and there's no way to find appropriate volume to be able to flip this high demand stuff consistently enough to make decent money. And I just want to say again, that it's not true for me. It depends largely on where you live. I think if you live in a major metropolitan area, you should be able to make this work. Here's addendum number two. It's the next day around 3 p.m. And <laughs> just want to illustrate that when you get serious about really focusing on the quick flip, it pays off. It doesn't pay off with margins that you can really brag about in social media. You're not going to be buying any new cars overnight. But my god, I mean, it's not always like this, but man, it works. Give it a shot.